Here we go. Okay. So, hi, I'm George Sabo, and I used to teach in the anthropology department. And I used to work here at the Arkansas Archaeological Survey, and I retired. And uh, so, I guess the best thing that can be said about my presentation to you today is that it's a, a elderly retiree grasping at the fragile straws of memory. Uh, and we'll see how it goes. Uh, and what I'm going to try to do with Jared Hebworth, uh, who knows more than I do, um, uh, is that we're going to, rather than do a whole sweep of, of Ozark Indian history, uh, we're just going to touch on some high points. I think that will give you a good sense of uh, what American Indians living in this area accomplished uh, at key points in time. Uh, and then, uh, and, and we're kind of going to do a tag thing, team sort of thing. I'm going to talk a little bit, and then Jared is going to show you some materials that correspond to what we're talking about. And I suppose maybe the most charitable thing that can be said is this will probably be the only talk anyone ever will give or hear uh, that could be subtitled. Um, from Berengia to King Hill and five easy pieces. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. Okay. Um, five easy pieces was a movie, you know, with Jack Nicholson. Yeah, okay. My jokes usually fall pretty flat. <laughs> uh, so anyway, the first period, the first uh, episode and accomplishment we're going to talk about took place uh, after the Indians had already been here for a couple of thousand years. Uh, the very earliest Indians to come into North America and arrive in Northwest Arkansas are referred to generically as the Paleo Indians. And on the map on the left, uh, you can see two routes by which we believe ancient Siberians, uh, ancient Asiatic people reached North America. One was through a gap between the Laurentide and Cordillera and ice sheets, which were still in the process of melting uh, about 13,000 years ago. And so that's the red line that you see kind of going through there. Right along the coast, you can see sort of a blue line. Uh, there's mounting evidence, and it's actually pretty good evidence, that another group, other groups of people, uh, even earlier, because this route was accessible earlier, uh, made it across the North Pacific Rim and went down the west coast of Canada and the United States, got all the way down to South America. There's a couple sites in South America that are uh, pretty close, they're 15, 16,000 years old. Uh, pretty good, uh, unimpeachable evidence, uh, good context and so forth. And the only way they could have got uh, that way would be go along the coast rather than through the interior. Uh, so some of those people ended up uh, in this area Northwest Arkansas, um, uh, and, and the Mid-South in general. Uh, and the map on the right just kind of shows in the dark green areas where we have evidence for people arriving first. And then the brownish sort of areas is where over the next couple thousands of years, their descendants kind of spread out. But these people um, had to cope with very cold environments, very much unlike what we have here today, uh, the environments that were here at that time could be pretty well compared with far northern Canada today. Uh, and so people were probably dressed up pretty much like Inuit people in the Arctic dress today, but down here. Uh, and, and there were large animals, uh, mastodons that, um, uh, were available down here in addition to other big species, but there is ar good archaeological evidence. There are kill sites of these large ice age animals, both in Oklahoma and Missouri. Uh, we do have evidence of the presence of those animals here in Arkansas that have been excavated in a couple of places, a particularly good specimen was excavated by one of our archaeologists, Julie Morrow at Arkansas State University. Uh, several years ago. Uh, unfortunately, there was no direct connection with human predation uh, with that particular uh, uh, remain, set of remains, uh, but we do have hunting implements embedded in uh, 
uh, and in context with the uh, mastodons in Missouri, uh, kind of near uh, South St. Louis and then over in uh, uh, Western Oklahoma. And the toolkits uh, that we see at these sites, uh, and, and we do have a few sites here in Arkansas, although they're, they're not, uh, they don't have the same kind of very high quality context that we have in other parts of the Mid-South. But uh, on the left are, are some stone blades, in the upper left-hand corner, some little pieces that are effective at engraving bone and antler and ivory uh, and scraping and cutting and, and hunting implements, spear points, and so forth. All of these are designed for maximum effectiveness in taking down and processing large animals uh, to get not only the meat, but the ivory, the bones, the hides that can be used to make shelters, clothing, uh, feed the population, and so forth. So these people were pretty mobile. Uh, and, and all of our evidence does point pretty uh, securely to a way of life that was based around, organized around large animal predation. Um, then when the ice age came to an end by about 8,500 BC, uh, by that point, people had begun to settle down and be beginning a little bit more familiar with the local habitats, which is not something you would do if you're traversing the landscape at, at uh, what would be uh, comparatively a rapid pace. I don't mean people were running across the landscape day after day after day, but you know they would camp and they would live for a while and hunt and they'd move someplace else, kind of following the herds and so forth. They're not really developing their own territories that uh, they would inhabit and become very familiar with. But in the process of settling down as the Ice Age waned and as the Holocene geological epoch uh, began to develop, um, people did have a familiarity with other species. And so when the large Pleistocene animals went extinct, um, which was probably due to a combination of environmental change, habitat change, availability of food that those animals consumed, plus human predation, all of those things went together to drive these large species into extinction. Uh, on the North American and on Eurasian continents, then Indian shifted uh, towards the predation of things that are a little bit more familiar to us, deer, um, and, and uh, uh, as the rivers slowed down and warmed up, uh, fish and shellfish became available. Uh, as deciduous forests expanded uh, and took over boreal forests, you got the availability of nuts uh, and, and uh, fruit producing uh, 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 shrubberies and so on and so forth. So people were able to diversify uh, their uh, food getting economies quite a bit. Uh, and so you began to see the development expressed in the archeological record uh, of uh, people um, who had more diversified technologies that were more suitable, not only for the predation of animals and the processing of animal products, but for gathering and collecting uh, plant foods. And so with that, what I'm going to do, yeah, okay, and, we, and I'll just say that uh, by the next period of time, we, we refer to these people as the Dalton people. And a lot of um, people who aren't archaeologists wonder where archaeologists come up with these crazy names for things. And we usually name cultures or artifacts partly uh, after the places uh, where they were first discovered. But in this case, there was a state judge uh, in Missouri named S.P. Dalton, who was the first person to recognize this post-Paleo-Indian cultural manifestation is what came next. And so the whole cultural way of life and the artifacts were kind of came to be called the Dalton culture, adult toolkits after the judge uh, who discovered this stuff uh, very early in the 20th century. Uh, and, and so uh, what we have is uh, clear indications of the persistence of some of the kinds of tools manufactured in exactly the same ways uh, from the earlier Paleo-Indian material, but we have the addition of new objects 
uh, such as on the far right here, an uh, abs blade, which is sort of like an ax, except the blade is perpendicular to the handle. It's used for cutting wood, processing wood. Uh, and so you have clear evidence of uh, people adapting their toolkits to use a wider variety of raw materials. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to stop the screen sharing and there we go. And Jared is going to talk about some of the tools that provide the hard evidence for what I just talked about. Yeah. So we'll talk about a little bit of the artifacts that we might see here in Northwest Arkansas. And most of the artifacts that from those earlier days are gonna be the lithics or the stone material that preserves over time because uh, any of the imperishable things, uh, items, they just won't last in most environments. So either the Clovis point, the earliest points that we might see are these willow leaf shaped or lancelet blade shaped artifacts. And some of the technology that they came up with was fluting or taking a channel flute from these points to aid in the hafting of these points. So it basically, it's a, a flake that they drive from the bottom portion off and leaves a channel and it narrows the hafting ability here. So it's not built up so much around the hafting area. So which would impede penetration into things. So they're always trying to narrow it down. So this is some of the earliest te uh, technological feature that we see from these type points. But most of the points from this Clovis era are gonna be this lancelet shape. And as the late paleo, and here's a good example of a ruin, they'll actually take a channel off each end, which just really narrows the, the hafting for it to fit like this. And then uh, towards the end of the paleo, you get a smaller version, what we call a balsam point. It's just a smaller version of kind of like a Clovis point, still a lancelet shape, but much smaller. And we're thinking, you know, a lot of these were, you know, thrusting type implements or development of the atlatl that comes around. We know it shows up 17,000 years ago in Europe, which is basically a lever or a throwing stick. It's called an atlatl from because the Aztec were still used them and the early Spanish accounts recorded the use of this weapon that would it, uh, enable them to throw a dart and penetrate armor. So, but it carries on, but some form of this atlatl, which is double lever, you use your elbow and, and you'll throw it like this with a large dart, which is like a large arrow. And it'll fit into the back here. And then they could throw this and as it comes over and it increased distances and much more thrust than you could do by just your throwing a spear. So, and like you said, they were using it to take Mastodon and large Pleistocene animals, the bison antiquus, as we see through there. And so that remained, basically the point style or the projectile style that they used all through the Clovis period. And then, and they, and they had actually mounted these into four shafts like this that could also be used as an expedient knife. You just pull it out and you can replace these. It's almost like being able to reload your dart. You would carry several of these already hafted up on a four shaft. And then you would, the, the dart, this way to well, this portion would stay in the animal. The dart would eject. They could pick up the dart again and just basically reload and get enough. Instead of carrying a bundle of these darts, the theory of how that would work. So, Clovis times the same thing. And then, as George was saying, the Dalton period, which was several thousand years later, they're still basically using the technology of the Clovis period, lancelet shaped point with flutes or the fluting scar, the reduction of the haft area. And what we see at the Dalton period is, is a technological shift where they're starting to narrow the hafting of these points, narrow it in. And it's basically the precursors to notched and side notched points. And like I said, the ads, we find these ads, and like George said, the ads, it has a curved blade here as opposed to like a, a celt, which is just a straight blade, like an ax blade. This one has concave, 
which you would use for, you see it for people when you make bowls, wooden bowls. It's made for gouging and re removing large material this way. So most likely they were, and we see most of these ads is, show up on the eastern part of the state around all the braided stream beds, and they're probably for dugout canoes. We see abundant those. We don't see like, as many of the Dalton ads as up here in Northwest Arkansas. But that's some of the technology that they would use through there. And then you see where they've, they'll take a point and through a series of resharpenings, starts out like this, big broad blade. And then as they resharpen these with pressure flaking, they get down to a narrow thing. Some people will say they're drills, but they're probably just awls for puncturing hides and bone and being able to perforate something. And then you also see a lot of uh, scrapers, which are unifaced, smooth side, natural flake side on one side, and with a steep there ends where you can flesh a hide and things like that. And I'll go over with a toolkit right quick. This is basically the tools they used to make these points. And let me go back to these points, you know, not only are they a really nice artifact and the changes that we see on the basal portion of these points helped us determine times or whatever, but they're also works of art. You know, uh, it's individual expression, some of it taken to the highest level, just beautiful as some craftsmen were more proficient than others. And some of the, the finest, nap, we call it flint napping or napping the working <coughs> stone tools is at its pinnacle in the earlier years. You'd think it'd start out crude and through the years as technology, you know, the points would get better and better. But a lot of times we see that in this Clovis period, the earliest period, some of the finest workmanship on these points. And then through the years, you see a degrading of some of the quality, probably as they were moving into other instead of just relying on the stone tools, more bone points and, and other things like that. But basically they have like a, uh, you know, a, a hammer, which is usually made out of a, a elk antler or something like that, but they can also use stone and they would just, and they would uh, reduce, basically they would look for a, a core or a, a nice uh, cobble of some sort that's chert. The chert is the material that we have around here. It's, it's solidified crypto crystalline material, almost like glass. The glassier it is, the better it works, the better you can control flake removal to get what you want. But they would search out these cobbles. They would split them in half. Then you'd have pieces like this, what we call a core, just like the interior material of this. They would drive off through percussion here. They would hit on the edge and drive these flakes off here, which are expedient knife blades. Some of these are sharp as razor blades when they come off. And so just endless supply, very chert rich area. They can reduce these down. And then they actually use some of them for, for cutting. And then when they exhaust this core, it becomes like here where they can no longer drive off any kind of meaningful flakes of it, like here. And then they'll take this blank of a core, used core, and then they'll start hammering and you turn this into a hammer and they become very round with a lot of uh, impact fractures all over them. And then it, this is the hammer they use to start over for driving off flakes. So a whole cycle of these. And they would also drive off larger flakes here, and then they would work these into preforms or blanks. They'd start out roughing it out through percussion, driving off controlled flakes by setting up platforms. They knew exactly how to set up the edge where platform on here to drive off flakes so they knew how to reduce to try to make it thinner. And then when they'd get down to this stage, then they could go ahead and map it into a projectile point, or a, which you know as, as a point here by doing more refined techniques with antler tips pressure flaking, they could go and do the same thing with pressure and, and drive off small flakes and then create these notchings and just different toolkits. That, and so that pretty much stays the same. That's what we see, the lancelet point with a little bit of the Clovis technology, narrowing of the bases. So we see that things are changing a little bit through that period. 
And that pretty much covers the quick Dalton period. Did you want to go into Breckenridge or we want to go in that? Uh, you can talk about Breckenridge. And Breckenridge is a site that here in Northwest Arkansas that we worked on. It was excavated in the 60s, 61 and 62 by a couple of two different archeologists. And they discovered when they were excavated this area that there was this Dalton component at some of the lower levels, which was very important because you don't always get these and they don't always last the test of time from being destroyed. So we, in 2012, we had the opportunity to go back in and open up these units that were dug in the 60s to take a better look at what was going on. We had a professor, Dr. Margaret Kay, he wanted to look at soils and, and stratigraphic, stratigraphic levels and, and kind of how a shelter or a bluff shelter is formed. And so we did get in there and we opened that up and it was great because when we opened it up and cleaned all the walls from the 60s, we realized there were many more hearths, which is basically a fireplace in stratified levels all the way down to the floor of the shelter, which was shale. This, this black flaky shale material, very soft, easily eroded. That's what creates these bluff shelters that we have that's unique in Northwest Arkansas. Is along these bluff lines, you have these chert lenses, sandstone, limestone, but there's a shale lens also in these shelters, at different elevations in different parts of the region. But the shale layer erodes out a lot of times and uh, will create a bluff shelter or overhang where you can get up out of the elements and be protected from, from the weather. And so, so that's one thing that Northwest Arkansas has is these bluff shelters. And uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing because some of them are dry and these materials will last, perish, for perishable materials. Not every state has bluff shelters. So all their sites are open sites. So most of the wood and bone deteriorates over time, but we can still, find the, these uh, perishable materials in these bluff shelters. So it's a treasure for this region that we have. And so, see, and so anyway, the, we had the opportunity, we went in and cleared all these units out, and, but we also had in between two different units, what we call a bulk, just a unexcavated portion in between two units. We had, since it was 2012, we had the uh, really good mapping equipment. The technology from the 60s was just so much better. So we decided to open up this bulk area, which is basically a unit in between two of the units that were dug in the 60s. And so we dug it at 10 centimeter levels all the way down to the floor. And at the bottom, we were able to recover this point here in situ, which is a late Dalton variation towards the end of the Dalton period transitional Dalton, where they're starting to really narrow the house and become notched points. So that was good. And this, this artifact, I believe, is probably one of the oldest dated. It's the oldest radiocarbon dated artifact that we found in the state. And what's so great, we have these hearths. These hearths were very important. And so when you're in these lenses, you may see specks of charcoal throughout the soil, but you really don't know where that came from. Or did it come in through a burrow? Animal burrow or any myriad of ways through erosion, whatnot. But we had this point, but we were also able, I, I, able to identify a hearth fireplace within 20 centimeters of the point. And that's what we want to find is being able to find these artifacts close to carbon material where we can get, get a date. And it doesn't always happen, but we were. So this was only 20 centimeters from a hearth. And we got the date on that. And it was about 9,800 years old. So this is the artifact from that. And some of these older artifacts that are in these shelters will have a calcium carbonate built up on them from the limestone and the water percolating through, creates a deposit. In that area too, we also found a scraper next to it. So there's some of those tools. But anyway, so we're ending the, coming out of the Dalton period, the points to start, the regional variations are very broad. So people are starting to experiment, maybe using your own style or something like that. And so we're starting to starting to get into notch points. And I'll stop there. We'll go into the which will be in the archaic period, which is another period yeah. of time. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Let me
go back and restart sharing the screen here. Pick up where we left off. Okay, where were we? We were, let me go back to this slide actually. Oh. Let me go back. This way. Okay. So the I want to pick up on two things that Jared mentioned. Number one, the bluff shelter sites. Those would fit into this model on the left of you know different areas where people went to and used. So the bluff shelters would be a special purpose site where people would go camp temporarily to hunt in the area away from where their main base camp was or gather plant foods. Or another thing, Jared mentioned that the sediments are very, very dry. And so they, and very stable. So they store, I mean, they, they uh, preserve uh, organic materials very well. So people would use those as a place to store their food uh, so that it would be uh, preserved, nice dry environment out of the weather, out of the rain, out of the cold or the heat. Uh, and, and so the bluff shelters were used for a variety of purposes. So as long ago as uh, uh, nearly 10,000 years ago, the Indians figured this out and this became an important element of their landscape. Yes, ma'am. When, when you say um, people, does, does, there, does this collection of people like have a name? For the people, yeah, we don't know what they were called, what they called themselves. Okay, uh, you know the, the a lot of aspects of their social life and their religious perspectives, their language, things like that, don't preserve directly in the archaeological record. But there are indirect indicators of some of those things. So, for example, way over in eastern Arkansas, northeastern Arkansas, near Jonesboro. There's a Dalton Age site, which is a cemetery where the Dalton people buried their dead in a systematically laid out cemetery. Now we didn't find skeletons at this site. We found, because it's 10,000 years old, skeletons generally don't preserve that long uh, in the kind of soils in the Mississippi River Valley. Of course, there are, you know, there, there are humanoid hominid skeletons in Africa that are three million years old or more, uh, but those are have turned in, those are the bones are mineralized uh, and, and uh, under extraordinary circumstances. So here and there, we will find mineralized skeletons that are very, very old. In this particular case, um, the, uh, through a geological process, Although the human remains had deteriorated, little bits and fragments of them had been uh, what are called calcined, uh, calcium materials had replaced the bone material uh, in, in little bits and fragments that were preserved, but the bone structure could be identified and it was distinctively human. And so, uh, but there were clusters of Dalton are the kind of stuff you see right here. There were clusters of that material regularly arranged. And the important point here is that uh, through these practices of burying deceased members of the community, as long ago as 8,500 BC or you know, more than 10,000 years ago, uh, these people developed a relationship with the land. And they actually put this in their own social terms. They, they um, uh, developed a kinship with the area that they occupied based on the presence of their ancestral remains within that area. And so the land, they were, they were related to the land through their the burial of their ancestors. And so this is Today it remains a very important concept among American Indians, but the Dalton era 
burials tell us that there's great antiquity to that sentiment about the land. And that's something people of a Euro American background didn't develop. You know, we have different belief systems. And so this, this very distinctive element of American Indian belief systems is evidenced in the archaeological record going back in Arkansas 10,000 years. And, and so, uh, and the people up in this area are probably doing the same thing, although we don't have any Delta era cemeteries uh, up here uh, that have preserved. Anyways, oh, and one other thing, Jared mentioned bison antiquities. This is a very large Pleistocene age bison. Over in Oklahoma, there's another site one of our colleagues uh, excavated, which is a place where the Folsom people, the people that made the little Folsom points that Jared mentioned, drove bison antiquities, these ancient huge bison into an arroyo where they all kind of crippled themselves and could be killed very easily. Uh, and by the, by the uh, Paleo Indians, the Folsom culture Paleo Indians. And one of the, uh, and so there were, there were piles of bones that had been processed and the butchering of the animal. And one of the uh, bison uh, uh, skulls on the frontal bone had a red ochre uh, zigzag design on it, kind of like a Grateful Dead steal your face design. You all familiar with that? I, I'm a deadhead. I, my kids were little. We took them to Grateful Dead Cap, so it's all summer. So you're right, pretty familiar with the motif. Uh, but anyways, that was what was great or painted onto this, which uh, is a material indicator of uh, religious devotion. In other words, thanking the spirit of the animal for giving up its corporeal substance to feed the people so that as that soul was properly thanked when it went into another body, it would know that people were respectful of it. And so it would uh, make itself uh, available for hunting uh, in future generations of, of the buffalo. So we have that indication uh, going all back to these very early times uh, of these religious aspects. And so the point I wanna make from this is that 10,000 years ago, when we had this transition, from you know, that uh, remarkably reworked the landscape from the Ice Age to the modern Holocene Age, the Indians very effectively adapted their way of life to successfully persist in this very different environment, uh, using along with their technology, their social and religious beliefs to maintain themselves within a landscape of their own cultural definition. So that's kind of an important aspect of American Indian history uh, that often gets very easily overlooked if all you're doing is paying attention to the artifacts. You know, it's a lot of collectors will pay attention to the artifacts, but one of the powers of scientific archaeology is we look at the context of all of this stuff and we can draw these conclusions about the social and the religious perspectives of these ancient people uh, from, from looking at the material that they, that they made. Uh, which is kind of the same thing you all do in your examination of artworks uh, uh, today. So, and that, anyway. that painted skull is also one of the earliest painted art forms that we see in North America. Yeah, yeah, we do have the the, we, the farther back you go in time, uh, the fewer materials persist in the archaeological record. You know, time is destructive of material objects and, and uh, but uh, even uh, from the from the very uh, beginnings of human history in the western hemisphere uh, we do have um, a, a corpus of artworks that suggests that the people that initially inhabited the western hemisphere sometime between you know 15 and 20,000 years ago whenever it first began did bring with them a very rich artistic tradition. And so that's something that uh, a lot of people are particularly interested in. And, and, and we do have people that are specialists in Pleistocene age art and so forth. And it's a very rich, interesting field of study. So on to the second point then, the archaic. Now this is, the archaic era as you see is, is 
a catch-all term that uh, earlier generations of archaeologists used to characterize this long period from 8,000 BC to 5,000 BC. So, you know, 7,500 year period of time in which earlier generations of Arkansas of, of archaeologists uh, thought nothing really happened. You know, just this small scale hunting and gathering way of life persisted. Uh, what we now understand, uh, particularly with discoveries that have been made over the past 50 years or so, is that this was a very dynamic period in which a lot of very significant developments were made. Uh, as people settled down, as they diversified their economies and began not only hunting in the woods for deer uh, and collecting uh, plant materials, nuts and so forth from the woods, uh, but they also began to use riverine and lacustrine river and lake environments to get fish and shellfish and waterfowl and so on and so forth. Uh, so they're diversified uh, economies uh, that were very successful. Uh, one anthropologist back in the 1970s referred to these hunting and gathering people as representing the original affluent society. And what he meant by that uh, was that uh, these people, there we go, uh, basically only had to work maybe two days a week to supply all of their material needs. The rest of the time they could devote to art, to religion, to social performance, to doing whatever they wanted. So they were they had affluence in the sense that they were able to uh, supply their material needs uh, very readily. And so um, in that context, as people settled down in this part of the country here, and the Ozarks and the Mid-South, uh, they began, their base camps became larger. And so think about this, they began to clear out the floodplain areas that they were living along. Uh, they began to enrich the soils from trash and so forth, uh, disturbing them from uh, and opening up the sunlight and everything. So they created a disturbance zone, what ecologists uh, refer to as dis disturbance zones, um, in enriching those sediments uh, through their activities. And so that created an environment which was uh, preferred by all uh, a variety uh, of invasive plant species that are generally seed bearing grasses uh, and many different species of them. And some of these species, like uh, lamb's quarters, which is a form of amaranth, um, which is like quinoa, okay? So it's a nutritious seed plant, uh, and sunkweed, and arachnotweed, um, uh, and, and other plants, sunflower and so forth, uh, began to invade the areas in which people were living. And so they're going, huh, oh, look at all these seeds. You know, they collect the seeds and found out that they were a good source of nutrition and tasty and could be used with other stuff that they gathered uh, to, to make porridges and stews and, and, uh, and breads and that sort of thing. Uh, and so they began to systematically collect, save the seeds, especially from the bigger plants, plant them the next year. And so in this back and forth process, they were able to domesticate these plants. And so in this area, uh, beginning about 7,000 years ago and reaching a point of completion between five and 3,000 years ago, the Indians of this area domesticated a variety of these grassy seed bearing plants, sumpweed, knotweed, um, kinoponium, uh, or lamb's quarters, uh, some varieties of squashes uh, and sunflower. Uh, and, and so this is one of, now we know that there are about 15 or 20 places in the world where people independently domesticated plants. This area is one of those. So that's pretty cool, okay? And so this is one of the places where, you know, agriculture was invented. But actually what we have learned in studying carefully all of these different places around the world where plants were domesticated is that agriculture actually took a long time to develop. Uh, at first, uh, these plants were um, uh, 
just incorporate it into a more diversified economy. And one of the things also Jared mentioned was that um, these rock shelter sites, which are unique to some areas of the world, including the Ozarks, again, providing the dry environments, uh, there are organic materials that are preserved in these archeological contexts that we find few other places in the world. Uh, you're gonna to get to see when we get done, we'll go out the hall and look at some materials that uh, Mary Souter, the museum curator, put through the window where you can look through there. That bag is woven out of a plant called Rattlesnake Master. Uh, it was radiocarbon dated to about 20 AD, and it is full of domesticated kinopodium uh, and sunflower seeds. And uh, we have, uh, in the past couple of years, acquired some uh, micro uh, computed tomography scanners. And so we looked inside the bag so we could figure out how many uh, kinopodium seeds and how many sunflower seeds there are. It's about a three quarters to one quarter mixture in favor of the kinopodium or, or, or lamb's quarter seeds. But they're the domesticated strains. Yeah. Um, uh, um, um, uh, maybe I'm not completely, um, like I'm trying to get the, the okay. timeline in my head, but, but uh, is it that these uh, people start uh, settling um, like in an area before agricultural yes. culture? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And the, domesticated, the domestication of plants was a product of people settling in one place, living there, year after year after year, generation, another generation, another generation, disturbing the environment to attract these plants, which they then began to uh, make use of. So the process of domestication, we understand uh, now through our ability to look at the genetics of these ancient plants, to look at their DNA and so forth, uh, these plants could be domesticated within a generation or two. We used to think it took hundreds of years of domesticated plants. No, it didn't take, took 20 years of domesticated plant. Uh, that's how quickly, but that doesn't mean that people then invented what we call intensive agriculture from that moment on. That process took many, many, many generations, uh, but it was because people were, were able to settle down, subsisting, living off of, wild resources uh, that then made it possible for them to domesticate some of those species. Which, so, so that domestication was a passive byproduct of just proximity? Well, it was, it, no, it was active because okay. people understood what they, they, once they began to harvest those plants, they began to figure out uh, uh, the, the annual reproductive cycles okay. of those plants. One of the things we want to recognize is that people that live off the land we said generations ago, we would refer to these as primitive people, more primitive. They had a high level understanding of every nuance of their environments, every structural element of their ecosystems, the ecological processes. You know, there are all these people running around with a PhD in natural science. It's basically how you want to conceptualize these ancient people. And so they understood what was going on to a very high degree of resolution, very uh, deep level of understanding, and we're able to manipulate uh, elements of their environments. Uh, when it gets out of control, as it is with us, then we ruin our environments uh, through our ability to manipulate them. Uh, but on the other hand, environments can be manipulated uh, so that they can benefit human consumers, but still have a productive, vi uh, viable, environment that's able to sustain itself as well. And so that's what's going on here with the domestication of these early plants. But it's because of this unique geological characteristic of the area, the presence of these dry bluff shelters that we even have this evidence. And so that's what is so cool about the archeology span of Northwest Arkansas. Yeah. And, and just so I understand, so the, the, the theory is that these people settled in a single place was because of the burial grounds. Well, no, the burial grounds, were a byproduct of people being able to settle. 
They settled first, and then okay, somebody dies. What are we going to do with them? Uh, well, okay, wait a minute. Let's you know we're we're not moving all over the place anymore. We're here, generation after generation. Let's start making an area where we can memorialize the legacy of our ancestors by burying them and maintaining those burial grounds as a part of our cultural landscape. Why, why do you think they, they settled instead of being nomadic? Well, uh, because life is easier that way. You know, you, you can uh, gather more, somewhat more material possessions if you're not mobile. Uh, if you're just coming into a, a uh, you can think about it this way. Uh, at the end of the Ice Age, when these Asiatic populations came into North America, they came into a whole hemisphere, North, Middle, and South America. They had no other people. It was rich with resources. And so there is, I don't want to, you have to be careful with this metaphor, but people are going, wow, look at this entire new world that we have. And they just kind of raced across it. Uh, because they were able to do that because there are these large animals all over the place. And so they could just go hunt and stay for a while and keep moving and stay for a while more and keep moving. But then eventually after uh, you start having neighbors here and there, you began to go, well, let's settle, let's make this area our own. You know, as, as the populations of those initial colonists uh, began to expand, uh, then they slowed down and be began to uh, become familiar with local habitats, reside permanently in those habitats, and then have an effect, a back and forth reciprocal uh, uh, relationship with the local environment and its resources. So that was the kind of process that led people to settle down. That's a great question. Thank yeah. You. So, um, From about 1000 BC or so, uh, until about 1000 AD is this period of time that we refer to as the Woodland Period. And this is the period in which we see, I don't wanna to say too much about it, um, other than with respect to domesticated plant production, we see people beginning to intensify it. Uh, it becomes a larger and larger component of their diet until uh, after about between 1000 to 1500 AD, uh, agricultural produce becomes the primary source of food, not the secondary source of food. And so the woodland period was the transition where it goes from being a secondary incidental food source that provides some extra security. You know, if, if, if you go out to hunt, well, I couldn't hunt a deer. And, and uh, there was a frost and it killed all the nuts that we couldn't get in. Well, you have these other things now that you've been cultivating in your small gardens that can see you through. Uh, so it was a backup food source at first, but then as people began to get better and better at it, and as new crops that were domesticated elsewhere in the Western Hemisphere, corn, for example, which was domesticated in Central America, as it moved into this area, people began to figure out that, well, yeah, we can make these gardens with lots of corn plants, and I mean, that provides actually quite a lot of food energy for us. This can sustain an even bigger village for a longer period of time, and we can make corn stews and just put a little fish or a little bit of duck meat in it, uh, or, or some deer meat in it, whatever, and hey, we're good to go. And so uh, the, the uh, contribution of agricultural produce then uh, became to be, uh, uh, take up a larger and larger portion of the diet. And so the consequence of that is the proliferation of tools that are suited for tilling the land, stone holes, for example, uh, bowls for grinding the grain, uh, and then also fired clay pottery for cooking the grains. Uh, and so, you know, the pottery doesn't come along until at least 2000 years after people started producing grains. So that's a measure of how long it took for 
grain production to assume a proportion where, yeah, we need to have some specialized implements to prepare this stuff in. Uh, and then also the bow and arrow was invented during that period. So what we see in the, from the archaic to the woodland period continuum is the domestication of plants, the increasing reliance on those plants as a primary source of food, and the adjustment of technology of the material culture, the things people made and used in their villages that provided the implements that go along with agricultural production and reliance on that food. And with that, uh, Garrett can talk a little bit more about the uh, material culture associated with all of that, and I'll stop sharing. So the, the transition to the agricultural yeah. uh, period, was that the end of the two-day work week then? Uh, yes, that was, that's a great question. Yes, that was the end of the two-day work week. Yes, now, you're working, now you're working every day. Yeah, now you're asking because I'm yeah. like, oh, our society hit its peak 7,000 years that's ago. That's right. You realize some of them are working, you know, they have to watch some of this domesticated areas just for predators. So a lot of the work was just sitting there making sure it didn't get destroyed. <laughs> but okay, I'll go to the archaic here. That's where right after the Dalton, as we talked about, that you can see now they're developing more of a side notched technology, all for hafting where they could hide that hafting binding and still have a cutting edge beyond it. So they've are coming out of the Dalton, going into the archaic, you're starting to see variation. Like I said, there's more people and they're, they're moving down and having more semi-permanent base camps on these uh, river terraces uh, where they can exploit those areas. And we know that they, it, towards the earliest part of the archaic, you see some of these things, but by mid-archaic, you see these large blades and now they're basal notching. So another technology going from side notching to basal notching where they come straight up from the base and these large percussion flake knives we call Smith points, middle archaic about five or 6,000 years ago. We see those. And we also, at that point, we start seeing grooved axes where they actually have these grooved, where they peck this in with another rock. They'll peck that groove in and polish out, and then they'll have to do something. So these are the archaic, some of the first archaic axes we see will be these grooved types. And like I said, they had more time. They're starting to do more things, utilize, have time to utilize more things. So you see more decoration, these gorgeous or, or decoration or pendants that they could wear of some sort. So you start seeing more artistry and goods, not just survival. Weapons, and we also see uh, these what we call net seekers. They're just basically a net notched pebble, and they probably hung along the bottom of the net for fishing. And at this time, they were even able to weave nets. Hey, is it okay if we come up closer to you? Of course, it is. See? Yeah, yeah, come on up. Some social distance. See, I know it's hard to see on this plan. We couldn't figure out how to get it tilted up mm -hmm. in the camera and all that as well. But yeah, ask any questions. So, this is kind of like the earliest archaic points that we see in this area Graham Cave, uh, Rice Lobed, and then we go into a Smith. And then towards the end of it, we see these other basal styles. So, we, it becomes broad variation on point styles at this point. There's lots of time for experimentation. They're still doing this type of work of reducing this throughout time. This basically stayed the same all the way through beginning to end is this working this stone tool, making flakes, then working them down into projectile points. And at this time, like I said, is they're starting to get, they're moving on these landforms and starting to be more domesticated plants. We also start seeing a lot more gourds and squash that they're hybridizing. You know, we have a few native species around this area, but they're really small today. But we find these larger ones, fragments in these bluff shelters, thank goodness for the dry environments again, because then we find gourd fragments of these large gourds that they had to hybridize. And when they quit hybridizing or changed, that all went away again, and it went back down to the, the small gourds that we find today along the rivers. But they're all, you know, they were able to, or different cultivars or whatever, but they, these large gourds don't 
we don't find them naturally occurring. So they had to do something. They, they were working with these plants, this, this agriculture, these plants became the pen a lot of this religion, you know, like George was saying, they knew every aspect, every bug that affected them, every stage of that plant, everything it was very agricultural. The knowledge was incredible. So we start seeing, like I said, the early pottery, basically. This is before pottery, but they're using gourds. And if you look in the collections, you'll find a lot of later on, several thousand years down when the, the pottery came into being, you'll see a lot of replicated gourds made out of pottery from their ancestral pottery. So that just shows more of the plant that they're starting to utilize. They're on these landforms, these terraces, like these benches, just up out of the floodplain a little bit. You know, some of the earlier stuff we find on the second terrace, because there were still like these 500 year floods that come through, but then they would drop down to these lower benches. And I, what I've discovered here is they're caching these smith points at these sites. So they're kind of permanent villages, but they're still rotating out. They'll go in and exploit it different times of the year, whether it's like when the hickory nuts are ready or some type of plant material, they'll stay on the site and exploit it or hunt this area. And then they'll move, you know, a mile or two down to another uh, terrace bench and do the same thing and, and work that area and then, and then cycle around. And we know they're coming back because they're caching them. So they'll dig a hole, we'll put these in this hole with a bunch of blanks that haven't been notched yet, or preforms. And, and I've seen it tw twice now on these landforms with this type of point. So I know they're cycling through these areas, but they're really exploiting and they plan on coming back. And I guess these caches that we do find, they never came back. <laughs> Something happened on that thing and it broke. So they stay, and like I said, and then we get into the woodland, more thing, more agriculture, more plant-based stuff, the points, Changes stuff, uh, change again. There's a lot of at lateral use in this time. This is still right before bow and arrow. And these are some of the, the forms that we find from this uh, late archaic woodland period. We call these Gary points and King's Corner Notch and Table Rock points. But you know, again, then we don't see as many of these ground axes, but we see this type of chip thing. And they were also used as hoes, depending on how you have it in. And I've replicated some of these like this. And the only reason I know what the handle looked like is because they preserved in bluff shelters, the wood portions. So the Smithsonian owns them. We have them in our museum collections. There's a few examples of these that I've replicated from real examples that the bluff shelters preserved the wood portion of it. So that's another how important these bluff shelters are because we have, this is what we usually find on the open sites. Have you used them? Yeah, how, so how they're they're experimental. They? they work great. I mean, better than you would think. You know, it's like, you know, it's dull. They work amazingly well. I've chopped several trees down with them. And what's good, you know, you start getting a dull edge. You just take, you remove a few flakes and you have a sharp edge again until they're used up. So we find them at different stages, large, and then work down to where you can't use them anymore. So they'll have this technology in the wood, woodland and some of the archaic. But they can also half this blade in this direction. And we see that on these terraces. Then they're used as hoes. And we know that because there's a certain type of polish that forms by digging into the ground. It's sand polish. And some of these would just be beautifully shine, you know, that you won't get from wood chopping. So they were using them this way, and they're often being hafted in as hoe, hoeing it this way. And I think a lot of them that we see, and they're on these benches of these landforms right above the river. They're moving down towards the water, so they'll have water close. But, you know, they could also be used for clearing these vast cane fields, the river cane, our version of bamboo, that are growing on all these sandy benches where they're going down. They're going in and clearing them so they could use these to chop roots out like that. And when they clear these areas, then they have agricultural fields. The agricultural fields are also the same places where they move down onto these sandy, uh, enriched soils to where they can actually grow stuff. And that's where they start domesticating. So they can go in and clear these areas and then and more hafted knives. And at this point too, here in the woodland period, we start seeing basketry fragments show up. 
And these are some that have come out of the bluff shelters around here. These are the little splints from the cane. So basically take the cane too, like this, and split it in, and then they'll peel the shiny cortex edge off into these little splints. And this is a common object that we find in these dry shelters. These are preserved thousands of years old. And they're still, this is, these are real examples here. These splints, and this is what they're making. Yeah. These split cane baskets and other materials. They use root runners, several types of material they're making baskets. This is a historic Choctaw basket, but the, the historic Choctaw are still making the same way that we find these in these bluff shelters for thousands of years early. Some, in some cases, the design elements are the same all the way up into historic times that the native people have uh, carried on these traditions. And they can change designs, you can see on the inside, they actually had an art, artistic, and you can do it just by reversing the, the splint from shiny side to the interior side. And you see interior splints side out, and then the shiny outside cortex. But they could dye these and the dye would stick to the interior portion. So these were all decorative elements they incorporated. The people that wove the baskets were mathematicians. I don't know how you better to make this come out in their mind. They had this figured out how to know exactly how many and how to create these design elements, which you know it boggles my mind a lot. But so they were geniuses, so to speak. They were mathematician, artists. It was amazing. So that's more of the plant. We start to see more plant. They're able to work and sit down and, and make other things. We start seeing bone implements like these bone pins that are hairpins. Decorative pins basically split out of a deer femur or any kind of large animal, elk, bison, and they work them down into more decorative uses. And then we start seeing this material show up. And like you said, now, towards the end of this, they're still using that level, but they're going into the development of the bow and arrow. And then the, the points change considerably. They go from these large projectiles to these small points. And these are what these are true arrowheads. You know, people we call these generically arrowheads, but they're not arrowheads. It's only these really small ones are the true arrowheads. This is the only type that would fly on a shaft without being too heavy on the front end. So that's what, what we see. And that will take us more into the Mississippian, more of the agricultural stuff. And George wants to come back and talk a little bit more when we come back and then finish up on the okay. Mississippian <coughs> technology. And I'm mean, curious about you, you talked earlier about the the craft kind of going down mm -hmm. or like getting more I don't know slop. Yeah. Why, why do you think that is? Maybe less reliance on the stone tool. Um, Clovis and Dalton period. That's basically what you know. Although there there could have been antler points as well, but they really needed to make their their tools very good and efficient and just the skill level. I'm not, not for sure why, you know, yeah. because even in the Mississippi, you still get some very nicely done arrowheads, but it seems like the quality through the archaic is less, they're less reliant on that. Yeah. Although there's examples of good ones, it just depends, you know, Yeah. just like every group of people, there might be one artisan that's better than the rest or yeah. can, can execute what they're going for better. So. Yeah. But in general, it's just like when you in the paleo period, all, you know, most of the, everything is really nicely uh, executed. You know, uh, the next point in time that we want to look at our third uh, aspect of development is the, what we we'll refer to as the Mississippian period. And this basically goes from about 900 or 1000 AD up until the time Europeans first arrived in this area. And in Arkansas, that would be Fernando de Soto, who crossed the Mississippi River in 1541 and spent a couple of years wandering around lost. Uh, he actually died in Arkansas, uh, which was probably not a bad thing as far as the Indians were concerned at the time. But in any event, um, this is a period that was marked by intensive field agriculture where acres and acres and acres of corn fields, sustained towns that had hundreds and in some cases a few thousand people living all together. 
in neighborhoods with grass thatched roof houses, um, mound centers were places of intensive social, ceremonial, and religious activity for the community. So these were the well-organized complex societies that the earliest European explorers encountered. And what I want to point out for Northwest Arkansas is that uh, we have a series of mound sites. And I began studying these 40 years ago. And my colleague, Jessica Kowalski, who works at the survey here and continues uh, to look at this particular aspect, we have these sites uh, that were the religious centers for the dispersed local population. So you might want to think about these as medieval, compare them to medieval European cathedral towns, where the big cathedrals were the places where people from the surrounding series of towns and farms and so forth in medieval Europe would periodically go to the big cathedral towns. So these mound centers are the big cathedral towns for the local population. Uh, living up and down the different river valleys. Uh, you see on the left what one of these mounds looks like today. They've been eroded from natural and agricultural processes, but in the artist reconstruction on the right, uh, we've got some mounds that were used to bury some important people. We've got the temple mounds, the flat top mounds uh, that had religious shrines and other things on top of them. Um, my colleague Marvin Kay and I, 40 years ago, excavated a series of these sites in Northwest Arkansas. And in one of them, Marvin excavated a house where people lived at one of these sites. And so you can see the house in excavation and then the map. Uh, and it's, it's got, you know, it's square and it's got four walls and it's got a fireplace in the middle of it. And it's got debris strewn across the floor. The thing burned down accidentally. Uh, people had to race out to get out there as quickly as they could, leaving all of the pots and the food refuse and whatever else was in the house at the time to burn, uh, carbonize. Uh, and so we were able to identify all of it uh, as we excavated. Uh, however, uh, on the mounds themselves, we find evidence for structures, but they're a lot more formally constructed buildings. Uh, didn't have hearts. This one has an entryway. And the entryway was coated with clay and there were actual footprints in it. And we could identify, we measured and took casts of all of the footprints. This is back when before we had advanced imaging technology. So we had to do all this by hand. Uh, but we did identify three people uh, who went in and out. Uh, and, and as they uh, exited, they did a little pirouette. Uh, and so it was a, a ritual procession. Uh, there are no hearths. Uh, but we found a few fragments of human skeletal remains uh, in this. Uh, and so these were mortuary houses. And when people died, their remains were left to repose in these mortuary structures for a while. And then there was a ritual transfer of the materials, the uh, artifacts that uh, the, the ceremonial or personal possessions that the person was interred in the mortuary house with, uh, plus the remains, they were bundled, uh, taken to a burial mound, buried in there. So it was an extended process of burial that might take a few years to play out. Um, and it was just part of their religious activities. And there we go, okay. Uh, and so we're able to discriminate between the dwellings at these mound sites in Northwest Arkansas from the mortuary houses, uh, the dwellings have hearths, the mortuary houses don't. The entryways were purposefully and ceremonial blocked with the removal uh, of the human remains that had laid to rest for a while. Uh, the destructions were accidental for the dwellings. They were delivered for the mortuary houses. They were burned down. They were covered with sediments. Uh, in such a way so that as the, the remains of the walls burned, uh, they would, uh, uh, the pressure would, would uh, release a column of smoke that would go up into the 
air up and dissipate into the sky, you know, carrying aloft the spiritual materials from this world into the above world uh, of, of the people interred. Uh, and then uh, dwellings, once they were destroyed, uh, were uh, another replacement would be built elsewhere. But on these mounds, there would be another mortuary house built a couple feet above, but in exactly the same orientation. Uh, and if we look at the orientations, uh, compare the mortuary houses and the residential structures, the residential orientations were kind of so that the houses would be comfortable in the different seasons of the year, given prevailing environmental circumstances. However, the entryways for the mortuary houses pointed toward the winter solstice sunset position. That's probably when the ritual took place of emptying the remains and reburying them. So it was a, a seasonal ritual uh, that played out. Uh, and so what's kind of interesting uh, is that these local mound centers play out ceremonial activities uh, that are expressed on a much larger scale at a big ceremonial center, which is located just nine miles east in Oklahoma from Fort Smith. It's called the Spyro site. It's now a, it's a state heritage center. You can go visit it. Uh, and it was the big regional ceremonial centers that linked all of the Northwest Arkansas and other Northeastern Oklahoma and Southwest Missouri secondary mound centers. So there's this network of mound centers that were linked to this big mound center. Uh, and what's kind of interesting about Big Mound Center at Spyro uh, is that you see on the top map, uh, on the area that's the darker green, that is the Temple Mound and the Little House Mounds and so forth that are much like every other mound site in this area. Uh, a little bit bigger, but laid out pretty much the same way as the mound sites in Northwest Arkansas and in in Northeast Oklahoma and Southwest Missouri. But in the lower right of that map on the upper is a four lobed Craig Mound. Uh, and the, these other two mounds are labeled award mounds. And those are specialized burial mounds where we find the most extraordinary expression of this burial ceremonialism. And this is a, the lower part is a cross section of the four interlinked mounds. And over on the left side, you can see that there's a little hollow chamber. Uh, can you see that uh, rendered oh, on the artistic reconstruction? Okay, here's what was inside of that um, hollow chamber. There was in the center, an earth mother statue. Uh, in other words, the, the goddess, uh, that was in charge of agricultural reproduction and so on, social reproduction. Uh, there is a wooden figurine on the right side of that uh, diagram uh, that is an uh, artistic representation of a human leader of the community. And I'm not going to go into all the nuances of why we know all of this stuff. Uh, you'll just have to trust me that there's a lot of contextual evidence behind these interpretations. Uh, otherwise, we'd be here till the middle of the night going through all of the specific evidence, but which you don't want to do. Uh, but at any rate, uh, then there's a guardian figurine whose back is towards the center and way off on the top of it. Uh, and there are um, woven baskets containing uh, ceremonial paraphernalia. There are uh, gift objects from the community to the spirit world. Uh, just in between uh, those, those two figurines, the, the earth goddess, uh, there is a bundle that contains the remains of an individual um, who has been, the remains, and there, those remains are in our museum and have been handled quite a lot. Uh, so they represent another, the remains of another religious specialist whose memory was carried down uh, through the ages and whose power resides in that sacred bundle. Uh, but the other thing, the pile on the left is a bunch of conch shells that come from the Gulf Coast of Florida, Louisiana, that were brought up here, that were specially clean. And then decorations were carved on the external surface. So these are artworks. 
but they're storytelling artworks. And all of that, there was 104 whole shelves and all of the de decorations cohere around a theme that we've been able to reconstruct. Uh, and my colleagues, my colleague, Alex Barker and a couple of other people and I worked this all out. Um, mainly this is Alex's work though. And these are, and we'll, we'll take a look afterwards uh, at some examples in the window. Uh, but these are just the uh, designs that were carved onto the exterior surface of these conch shells. And on the left, we have an individual that's got a wedge shaped design. We call him wedge mouth. Uh, and you can see there's a fork pole in between. And, and he's opposed on the other side of the pole to a couple of heads. And this is an artistic rendering, an iconographic rendering of the concept of multiple generations. The detached head is not a head hunting victim. It's an artistic rendering uh, for this time period in this region. This is how they depict ancestors. It's just the head detached from the body. It's an ancestor. It's not someone killed and hunted. Uh, and there's good, there's artistic contextual information to back up this. But again, we're not going to get into it a whole lot. In the next one, number two, you see. And I'm going to just come up here and kind of point out some of these sorts of things. Might be a little bit easier. You see the wedge mouth character, and it's got these undulating poles. They have two characters that have cross-shaped or T's. I mean, we call them T-bar. And at this point, I want to mention that these are all rendered in profile view. If this guy turned around. And you looked at the design around his mouth, you see the round mouth and then pinched out on both sides. So it's like you're taking a circle and you're pinching it off. That's an artistic motif that's called an OG. And in Southeastern Indian art of this period, what that represents is a portal that ritual specialists can go through that connects this world that's perceptible by the human senses of touch, sight, smell, hearing, uh, to the invisible spirit world. So that the OG is a portal that allows us to converse between this world and the spirit world. This T person, if he turns the face here, he's got double lines and then coming up. So circle with a cross in the middle of it. That is an artistic iconographic depiction of this world. That's a symbol of the, the circle on the cross is the sacred fire where you gather around to conduct the rituals that enable you to converse with the spirit world through this portal sort of thing. So that suggests that we've got a spirit being and a human actor in these um, artistic renderings. And this is confirmed by the fact that this wedge mouth character on these shells appears not only as a anthropomorphic, you know, a person with a torso and legs and arms and a head, uh, but also we have some of these in which there's this wedge mouth head on a snake man, on a bird man, uh, and there's other animal, uh, panther. Uh, so in other words, this character is capable of shape shifting. Okay, humans can't do that, but spirit beings can. So that's further confirmation that we have a spirit being and a human. And here, the fork pole uh, is, is separating the human who's approaching, but not touch, not grasping. The spirit being is grasping the fork pole. So the fork pole is being introduced by the God to the human. Here, the human on the right side is grasping the pole with the uh, uh, spirit being releasing it. What Alex figured out, and this is again, we've got multiple examples, a couple dozen examples of each one of these. The thumbs pointing down is where you're releasing the pole, thumbs pointing up is the artistic uh, representation of the concept of grasping the pole. And then here, having grasped. The pole, uh, we have the human grasping it and dancing in celebration. 
And this is, you know, the uplifted knee, knee uh, and the back kick leg as an artistic uh, representation that we see across North America, Middle America for dancing. So he's celebrating your such of the fourth pole. What's the fourth pole? Um, the fourth pole is, uh, there, are, there are some stories uh, that must have existed. Of course, stories don't preserve, but they were passed generation to generation. And we have some colonial era and some later historic renderings uh, documentation of stories that were told by ritual specialists in American, uh, Southeastern American Indian communities. And basically there are stories where the forked pole uh, is a gift that a human has, gets from the spirit world, from a spirit being. There's one story in which, uh, and I'm gonna be just very brief with this, I don't wanna go too long, but, um, the brief summary version of the story is there was a brother and sister who understood that a nearby community was being troubled. And they were spent, this is back in the early periods of, of history when people were first put on earth. And so this brother and sister had special powers. Uh, so they were extraordinary individu individuals, but not spirit based, but just extraordinary humans with super human powers. And they traveled to this village and they found out that at night a forest monster who was not described but would come and, and spirit away some people. And this was troubling the community. So the young man went out uh, and spent a night out in the woods by himself uh, and went in and in a dreamlike state had a conversation with spirit beings who said, cut down this certain kind of tree and, make, and cut down a branch so that it's forked and this will be your special power uh, that we're giving you. And so the young man made a pole, forked pole, wrapped it up on high, took it back with him. Uh, and then there were, the story goes on about a bunch of things that went on in the village. But then again, the young man goes off into the woods with his pole and his bow and arrow, this time to meet the forest monster. And he goes out and the forest monster is covered with flints. So he's got an armor of these sort of flints. And so if you were just trying to shoot them with a bow and arrow, it wouldn't harm the forest monster. And so it, through kind of telepathy, the young man and the forest monster come to, came to understood that they were gonna fight it out to the death. Uh, and so if the young man won, then the village people would be protected. Uh, if the monster won, then he would just eradicate the people in the village one by one. The young man following the intuition he got from his seance with the spirit beings unwrapped the fork pole and held it up as the monster started to attack him. That, that froze the monster. And so what he was able to do then is take his bow and carefully aim and shoot between the flint armor and kill the forest monster, thereby saving humanity, saving the people in the village. The interesting, the religious nuance of this compared to Western religious traditions, you know, what do we do if we're facing a mortal problem uh, and we want God to help us? Well, we petition the Lord in prayer uh, in order to get God to take care of the problem for us. In the American Indian religious perspective, they want a gift of, they received a gift of power that enabled them to use their conventional means to solve their problems themselves with the assistance of the gods, but they did the work. They didn't expect the God to solve the problem for them, okay? To catch that nuance. So that's what is going on. That's what the fork pole relates to. Now, what was going on at the time that hollow chamber was created with all of those artifact conclusions and all of those um, uh, shell cups that were uh, engraved with these images and other support images that help us flesh out the elements of the story. Uh, all of this was created at about 1400 AD. Got high resolution dating this particular context. That was a period of time right at the end of the Little Ice Age climatic episode when people in this part of the world were suffering droughts that would persist for 30, 40, 50 years without break. We know this from tree ring studies that are very sensitive recorders of the amount of soil moisture 
Dr. Staley, David Staley over in, in Malcolm Cleveland over in the geosciences department are a couple of world's foremost experts in dendrochronology and studying tree ring. Uh, and what they tell us about the environment, they reconstructed these protracted periods of drought that not only affected the agricultural productivity of these people, but the rest of the natural world. So these people were really suffering. What happened to us a few years ago when Texas experienced a five-year drought? It just hammered the economy, right? Farmers were getting rid of their cattle, shipping them all over the place just to get rid of them because they couldn't stay. Modern industrial society, you know, we're brought to our knees with a five-year drought. Think about what these people were experiencing when they had a drought that lasted one or two generations. So what they were doing with this ritual at Spiro, in which we have evidence that people from Northwest Arkansas, other parts of Northeast Oklahoma, South Oklahoma, sorry, all gathered around 1400 to participate in the ceremony as they're trying to renew the world. They were trying to use the powers that spirit beings of their religious belief gifted them with in order to make a better world, in order to get past these environmentally induced tragedies that they were suffering. Uh, so that's another important element uh, of, of um, uh, the archaeological record. That's another high point that just gives us some insight into how people in this part of the area solved existential problems that affected their way of life, that affected the, the, the very possibility for their communities to endure. Kind. They did endure. They did solve those pro problems. So I'm going to, before we go back to Jared's uh, material here, uh, I want to uh, real quickly just touch on the fact that during historic times, when the first Europeans came into this area, this region was inhabited, including northwest of the Cane Hill area and elsewhere, by Osage people. Uh, and uh, the Osage people uh, had their own beliefs uh, about their creation uh, during primordial times when the spirits of their ancestors descended from the sky through the different layers uh, of, the, of the sky world to alight on a primordial oak tree that they then descended. Uh, and uh, as people, they transformed from birds to people uh, after they uh, alighted on this primordial oak tree. And then as they explored the terrain, they organized themselves into the earth people and the sky people. So if you were an earth person, you would um, uh, marry someone from uh, uh, the sky people, and then your offspring would belong to the division of the father. They were patrilineal. Uh, and then they further divided the earth people into the land people and the water people. So they had these different clans, in other words, uh, that organized their social communities. Uh, and what's kind of interesting uh, on this next diagram, and let me come up and point out here uh, again, I'll use this as a pointer. Um, so what we have on a typical Osage village is a road or pathway that goes in the center of the village. Uh, and we've got the earth people and the sky people uh, with the land people and the water people clans and the uh, sky people and the last to come clans um, uh, organized in this particular way. So the sky people are responsible for performing religious rights that sustain the spiritual well-being of the overall community. The earth people perform religious rituals that are designed to sustain the material well-being of society. These ritual activities have to be sanctified by smoke issuing from sacred pipes. So the sacred pipes that enervate and validate the earth people rituals are held, filled, and lit during the ceremonies by the sky people and vice versa. So that 
that element of the ritual creates two halves that can't be broken apart. They're dependent upon one another. Uh, and what's really interesting is that we see in parts of northern Arkansas distributions of lock art imagery. Uh, in other words, at these buff shelter sites, imagery that's painted with pigments, uh, artistic imagery that decorates elements of the landscape. And in the rock art that dates to the 1500s, 1600s, around in that era, what we see is north of the Arkansas River, which is east, runs east to west, more or less. North of it, we see imagery that relates to the spirit world, uh, phantasmagoric beings and so on and so forth. South of the Arkansas River, we see rock art that represents uh, people, animals, plants, in other words, the world in which people live. So the same conceptual division is, is expressed in artworks that are distributed across the landscape to uh, artistically uh, place this social model on the lands that the people occupy. So in other words, they create their own cultural landscape through artworks. Uh, and so this is kind of the world of the uh, Osage people. Uh, we'll skip over that. They, I want to go into the uh, historic period. They, the Osage did manage, once the, the uh, uh, European settlers brought trade goods in, they managed the flow of material resources, uh, corn, agricultural products from Indian communities, deer hides, and so on and so forth, beaver pelts, and that sort of thing. Uh, for European goods, they managed all of that trade, the Osages did in this part of the country. Europeans did. A colleague of mine, Kathleen Duval, wrote a book about the historic uh, period of Indian and European relations in Arkansas. The book was titled The Native Ground. Uh, the, the title uh, reflecting the fact that until the 1830s and until the United States ascendancy of power in this area, uh, it wasn't the Europeans that managed the land and the resources. It was still the Indians that managed it uh, and subsumed European economies with, within their own. And that's a, a historical point that a lot of people don't recognize, but it was, you know, the Indians were still masters of their domain uh, until well into the 19th century. Uh, at which point the lands were ceded uh, to Europeans uh, and um, the Cherokees came into this area uh, beginning in the very late 1700s. Uh, and they had large communities along the Arkansas River, particularly north of the Arkansas River, uh, up from there into the White River Valley. Because the Europeans had been in contact with British colonists as part of the British colonial empire along the eastern seaboard, uh, they had pretty much adopted European agriculture, European dress, many aspects of European lifeways, European style agriculture and so forth. So the Cherokees are hard to distinguish in the archeological record, partly because of that, partly also they lived in areas that were now inundated by all of the uh, dams along the Arkansas River that create Lake Dardanelle and so forth. That was actually the center of, of Cherokee population. Um, most of the Cherokees in Arkansas left by the late 1820s before the Trail of Tears Indian removals that took place in the 1830s up to about 1842. Um, but here's where we get our connection with Cane Hill. Then uh, the Cherokees, um, oh, and I forgot to label on the left, the fellow is John Ross, and on the there on the right uh, is an individual named Stan Lottie. And let me really quickly summarize uh, Cherokees during the Civil War, which brings us right into Cane Hill. Uh, and, and that is that, okay, I've lost 
my feed there, but that's okay. You saw the pictures uh, of the two guys. Um, John Ross was the chief of the Cherokee Nation uh, when they were in Indian Territory in the 1830s. Or, I mean, up, up, uh, this is uh, up, uh, closer towards the Civil War times. When we get into the eve of the Civil War, John Ross was the leader of the Cherokee community. And in uh, 1861, he was approached by then Governor um, Rector, uh, Henry Rector, was the governor of Arkansas, he's the sixth governor of Arkansas from 1860 to 1862. And in 1861, Governor Rector approached John Ross and said, uh, I'm hoping you will support the, Cherokee, the, the Confederacy uh, during the Civil War that it was just breaking out at that point. Uh, and Ross said, well, no, I think it'd be better if we uh, remain neutral. And the reason why Rector reached out to John Ross is that he was the most estimable leader of the various removed Indian tribe. So Rector thought probably correctly that if uh, uh, Chief Ross were to pledge allegiance, if you will, to the Confederacy, uh, then um, uh, he would, uh, bring all of the other uh, tribes, the Choctaws and the Chickasaws and so forth over into the Confederacy Alliance. And when he didn't do that, the other tribes remained neutral as well. Uh, the next year, Albert Pike, uh, who was living in Arkansas at the time, he was a lawyer. He was, uh, a, he was the Indian agent for the Confederacy. He went, and he was a little bit more persuasive, but he also did things for the tribes and, and so, uh, not only was he more persuasive, he was more, more rewarding and interactive with them. And he did bring uh, some of those groups over to the Cherokee side, Stan, or to the Confederacy side, I'm sorry. Stan Waddy uh, was the, um, uh, a leader of a minority group of Cherokee Indians who early on aligned with the Confederacy. Uh, and he formed mounted cavalry units that participated uh, in some of the Civil War engagements. For example, the battle that took place from May 7th and, or March 7th and 8th, 1862 at Pea Ridge. Uh, Stan Waddy, some of the uh, Cherokee forces uh, were part of that engagement. Uh, and, and um, uh, but with the defeat of the Confederates, at Pea Ridge, a lot of the Cherokees and members of the other tribes fled to Kansas where they reorganized uh, into uh, uh, union affiliated groups uh, who then participated in some of the other battles and at some of the minor battles in places like Cane Hill uh, and Poison Springs down in South Western Arkansas, you had small groups of union affiliated Cherokees and Confederate affiliated Cherokees <coughs> fighting with one another. And at Prairie Grove as well. Uh, and uh, so in this uh, context, uh, you had uh, groups uh, aligning uh, ultimately uh, both with the losers and the victors. Uh, but they were, they did play an important and significant role uh, in activities uh, of the Civil War, particularly the small battle that played out in 1863, I think it was, at, at Cane Hill. Um, now, also at Cane Hill, there's an interesting uh, uh, little phenomenon that, phenomenon, phenomenon that developed uh, in, is that a printing press. Uh, that had been used by a religious uh, a, a pastor to produce Bibles in the Cherokee syllabics. You're probably familiar with the fact that um, when the Cherokees were in Arkansas, one of the Cherokees named George Gist or Guess, uh, better known as Sequoia, invented the Cherokee syllabic system of writing. Uh, and then another Cherokee named Elias Boudino used that syllabic to produce a Cherokee newspaper. Uh, but then religious figures were producing Bibles in the Cherokee syllabics. And one of the printing presses that one pastor 
who was living over near Cincinnati, uh, Arkansas, uh, because he was indebted to Union forces, he donated as part of his debt payment uh, a printing press that ended up in Cane Hill and that one of the Union soldiers used to, pr to provide a, a Union paper called the Buck and Ball, uh, published in, in Cane Hill. Uh, and when one of our archaeologists got working here, Tika McLaughlin was doing excavations at a house that had served as a school in Kingville. She discovered little pieces of print in Cherokee syllabics. That is our final bit of archaeological evidence. Uh, of, of Cherokee presence uh, in, in Cane Hill uh, as part of, of what was the history of what was going on in the area. And Jared, you can kind of pick up if you can. On uh, uh, yeah, the topic. Yeah. So, yeah, we started out as uh, we had permission to work on this land at Cane Hill to survey, and we came across this. Uh, uh, one of the locations was the foundations of a, a building. And as we started excavating at that location, we discovered Civil War uh, artifacts, buttons, and, and, and such. And there was a little outbuilding there. And like George was saying, this, the 9th uh, Infantry or something out of Kansas, the Union, they, they were also called the, the Fighting Printers or something like that, because several of the guys were printers and knew how to run a newspaper. Anyway, they at this location that we were digging at, we first just thought it was a residential house, but then through uh, evidence and documentary, documentary stuff that we uh, were able to unearth and we realized it was a boarding school. But this location here, we just started out thinking it was a historic house, but as it started unfolding, we realized then as we were screening and washing and processing, we started finding this Cherokee syllabary type uh, set, you know, just like the printing set. But anyway, in the the official Civil War records, they talk about the, the Union troops there in Cane Hill. They stumbled across this printing press and all the type was dumped out and half of it was in Cherokee, syllabary type. And they collected up uh, the, the English type. And like I said, did the Union propaganda newspaper while they were at Cane Hill called Buck and Ball, which the Buck and Ball is a Civil War uh, ammunition round. It's a 69 caliber lead ball with three buckshot attached to it. And that's what it finally, that's the cartridge and buck and ball. That's what it, but anyway, it's this propaganda. So anyway, they talked about finding this at, the, at this location and where they gathered it up. So and then as we were doing the artifacts and going through there, we discovered that this, we had the Cherokee type at this location. So we can only assume this is the location where they first encountered this printing press, which was really a, the Park Hill printing press out of Tahlequah. And then later it was given to or sold to the guy of in Cincinnati, the preacher to do the Cherokee Bibles. And like I said, then it found its way to Cane Hill, but nobody knew, knew exactly where it was. So we can only speculate by finding the, the scattered Cherokee type that we're, we are at this location or one of the locations where, where they actually encountered this printing press. And I have a whole vision of where I can of how to test the site to see if we can find more of this, this type said, we were using quarter inch screens to process everything. These things will fall through. So I don't know how many we lost in the field by screening the dirt through these quarter inch mesh, you know? So I wanna go back and systematically put in these units with GPS coordinates and then to find the highest density of the type set and then put a unit over there and see what we could recover. I think that'd be interesting. I can agree with that method. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I want to do. You can help. Yeah. <laughs> you get permission. It's fine. And so, yeah, so that's the last. Anyway, at this boarding school, Stan Waddy's son was at this location. What Waddy? He actually died there while going to school at Cane Hill. Uh, and Stan Waddy came over to collect his body, probably from this boarding house yeah. location. Even. And a little bit on Stan Waddy, he was the only uh, native general in the Civil War. And he was also the last to surrender in the Civil War. So that's a little bit, and we can go into the whole fighting thing. My great grandfather fought there at Cane Hill. And, and he was part of the cavalry. But, but anyway, that kind of ends. But there was also trading with the Cherokee with uh, butt brush baskets. This is not really known that much. But 
from trading from Indian territory, Tahlequah over along all the Cherokee living there, there was a big market and they were, a lot of these baskets were sold in Cave Hill area in the historic period and all the way up into the yeah, yeah, yeah. 30s, 30s, 40s, maybe 1940s. Well, Abe, looking at the time here, and I want to be conscientious about your time mm -hmm. and then getting the students back on campus as some of them have uh, GA duties, graduate assistantship duties this evening. Mm -hmm. um, but I know Mary also put together like some perishable. Yeah, it's just right. How do we take a look at those? Amazing stuff. And I'm also I'm working at King Hill at the pottery location. Oh, you are the King Hill, yeah. Is that, Good. Huh? Is that private property? Is no, it's owned by King Hill. I'm working with Lawrence. Oh, the anyway, yeah, the Boonesboro Pottery from the late 1800s. Anyway, I've only been working a short time out there. We've been wanting to work out there for years. I just now had this opportunity since Kane Hill acquired the land and working with Lawrence. But you know, I've already I've already discovered a whole new pottery kiln. So and it's incredible. There's tons of pottery shirts. Anyway, it's it's very cool. So you out there working this time of year? Not right. Just no, not right. Yeah. Just when the weather cool. permitting. I did I worked up till Christmas here and there, just Same but it's only me. So yeah. basically, so it'd be nice to have the crew to get a bit of trying to and, Ravel that archaeology a little bit for them, for our, us and them, yeah. for the state of Arkansas. So here's a little sheet there that goes with the artifacts out here. Oh, yeah, Can you want to come out here? Yeah. Is that Mary Sue? 